Let us start at the beginning. When did the first humans arrive in India? How did they get there? And where did they go on to after India? Many people are aware that the human story begins in Africa and that we are all African. But it now seems that in a similar sense, most of us might be Indian too, descendants of people who once lived in South Asia. National Geographic and IBM have teamed up together over the last decade to carry out a huge genetic study to answer questions through their Genographic project. Over 700,000 people in 140 countries have participated. And you can too by following the link we provided below and learn more about the project. Together with the work of many other geneticists and archaeologists, a new picture of the human story is beginning to emerge. Many people have a rough picture in their heads, I know I certainly did, of early humans heading out of Africa via the continent's northeast, modern day Egypt, into what we call the Middle East, the Fertile Crescent. Before, that group then split up with some people going off into Europe to the west and others going east to Asia, India and China, Southeast Asia, eventually Australia, and people going through China into Northern America and down through into Southern America. Professor Stephen Oppenheimer has written a number of popular books about the human story, including The Real Eve. He is now based at the Institute of Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology at the University of Oxford. According to Oppenheimer, writing in 2012, anatomically modern humans left Africa via a single southern exit about 70,000 years ago and rapidly spread around the Indian Ocean towards the Antipodes. Long before a small branch left a South Asian colony earlier on the trail to populate Europe. A few years earlier, uh, 2007, Quentin D. Atkinson, Russell Gray and Alexei Drummond looked at mitochondrial DNA uh, and, the, and the variations within mtDNA to help them predict population sizes in humans. Corroborating Oppenheimer, this revealed what they called, and I'll quote, a major Southern Asian chapter in the human story. Quoting from their 2007 paper, outside Africa, the earliest and fastest growth in population is inferred in Southern Asia 52,000 years ago followed by a succession of growth phases in Northern and Central Asia 49,000 years ago, Australasia 48,000 years ago, Europe 42,000 years ago, the Middle East and North Africa 40,000 years ago, New Guinea 39,000 years ago, and the Americas 18,000 years ago. And then a second expansion into Europe 10 to 15,000 years ago. Comparisons of relative regional population sizes through time suggest that between approximately 45 and 20,000 years ago, most of humanity lived in Southern Asia. These findings provide a unique picture of human prehistory and demonstrate the importance of Southern Asia to our recent evolutionary past. Genetics is an increasingly exciting area for research and sure to bring even more interesting and more conclusive results in the future. Perhaps you'll even contribute to it by testing your own genetic lineage and heritage through uh, projects like National Geographics or by conducting groundbreaking genetics research yourself. It does seem though that the part of the world that we now call South Asia, in particular India, was incredibly important to human prehistory and therefore our story. If the first age of humanity is the one where we lived by hunting and gathering, then given the evidence of population growth, India proved to be the most successful part of the world. 
Whether this was driven by favorable environmental conditions or by breakthroughs in human behavior and capability, or both, is also a question for debate. People have talked about a great leap forward for humanity, occurring when the first cave art appears in Europe 40,000 years ago, in southern France and northern Spain. This story fits with the Eurocentric narrative of discovery happening in the West before diffusing elsewhere. However, in 2014, similar-looking cave art in Sulawesi, Borneo, was dated to a similar period. Dr. Maxine Aubert of the University of Wollongong, an archaeologist, says, Our discovery in Sulawesi shows that cave art was made at opposite ends of the Pleistocene Eurasian world at about the same time, suggesting these practices have deeper origins, perhaps in Africa, before our species left this continent and spread across the globe. The art of both Borneo and Europe is similar in style and technique. India too has cave art, but the current dates are younger, about 30,000 years ago, for the Bimbetka cave paintings in central India. Could the Bimbetka art be older? Could there be older cave art in India still waiting to be discovered? Sea levels were much lower then, so could there have been cave art happening in what, under what is now the Arabian Sea on the west coast of India? It is a mystery that 5,000 miles to India's east and 5,000 miles to India's west such similar cave art should be found in places that we also know to have been populated by people whose ancestors spent thousands of years living in South Asia, perhaps in India. Independent discoveries, diffusion from India, diffusion from Europe to Borneo, very, very fast, or the other way around. Answer this question definitively and you'll grab headlines around the world. Could it be that this earliest of all India's diasporas, as they circulated the globe, brought with them the cognitive and imaginative talents that we associate with the ideas behind the great leap forward? The next big phase for humanity was the dawn of the agricultural age, tens of thousands of years later, which occurred as the planet's climate warmed following the end of the last glacial maxim. After about 12,000 years ago, right up until 200 years ago, we lived in the agricultural age. As Angus Madison's research demonstrates, India has the largest population and an economy in the world from the 1st to the 15th century. Madison doesn't go back further than this, but given the genetic research pointing to India's population being the largest during prehistory, and other archaeological evidence which making up what is now known as the Indus Valley Civilization, which at its peak four to five thousand years ago was the largest of all of the great river civilizations in the world at that time. Uh, the other major ones being, of course, Egypt around the Nile, Mesopotamia between and around the Euphrates and the Tigris in modern-day Iraq, and in China around the Yellow River and its delta. The great conversations that we mentioned in week one are beginning to take shape at this point. The Western one comes out of a fusing between Egyptian and Mesopotamian. And then, of course, there is the Chinese one and the Indian conversation. One of the great unresolved debates in history is whether India's Vedic culture and the Sanskrit language are indigenous to India or if they were brought into India several thousand years ago 
by people previously living a nomadic life in Central Asia. It seems odd to deny that the sophisticated Indus Valley civilization and the sophisticated Vedic culture, which refers to the same geography, were not one and the same. But a debate has been raging for over a hundred years regarding this exact question. Professor Edwin Bryant from Rutgers University collated various perspectives on this so-called Indo-Aryan controversy. Uh, and he put them together into a great book which provides an overview of the key linguistic and archaeological evidence and arguments for proponents of both the migration into and the out of India theories. Bryant, I'm just going to spoil uh, uh, the conclusion here, but Bryant doesn't think either side has conclusive evidence. Uh, so there is undoubtedly much more work uh, required in order to resolve this question. If it is proven that the Indo-European language family comes out of India, it would truly mark one of the greatest contributions that India has made to the world. And if it proves that it's not, then the case would be settled. Your assignment this week is to translate the Indus Valley script. Here are some examples of the Indus script and we'll set the challenge to translate them later on. Okay, I'm actually joking. Uh, the thousands of seals uh, discovered in archaeological digs in the Indus Valley, northwest India and Pakistan, um, have never been translated. No one has yet been able to do this. But whoever eventually does crack this code uh, will have solved one of the greatest puzzles that remain in world history. So there we have it. People have been migrating into and out of India for tens of thousands of years. Uh, they've been doing so through two principal routes. Through the northeast, through modern day Burma, Myanmar, and through the northwest, through modern day Pakistan, Afghanistan, and southern Persia, Iran. The oceans, the Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal, and Indian Ocean, and the Himalayas uh, are basically barriers, so that there are only these two entrance and exit points to the Indian subcontinent. And that has proved critical so often throughout India's history. Of course, the other way that you could get to India is by sea. So three to 4,000 years ago, when the first ocean-going uh, ships were plying the seas, um, we begin to see trade, maritime trade, between the Indian civilization, the Indus Valley civilization, and Mesopotamia, and Arabia, and Egypt, and East Africa. In fact, Northwest India, modern-day Pakistan and Afghanistan might well be the most important crossroads in the world. Uh, right from human prehistory, as we've just seen, all the way up to the 15th century, when symbolically at least, this was still the world's economic center of gravity. And in a literal sense, because of its place on the Silk Roads network, which connected China, India, with Persia, Europe, and Egypt.